May I have your attention, please? So everybody, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Hayes. Uh, I'm chairman of the Gold Industry Group and also chief executive of the Perth Mint. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our fifth Diggers and Dealers breakfast event with our colleagues Deloitte. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and future. Our topic for discussion today centres around developments in the decarbonisation of Australia's mining sector and the opportunities that lie ahead in a transition for all of us to a low carbon or zero carbon future. Like you, I'm really keen to hear what our speakers have to say today and I think it promises to be quite a lively debate. But before we commence the panel session, I'd just like to share a couple of highlights with you from the Gold Industry Group's initiatives uh, that we've achieved uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, and just play a TV ad that aired last month uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. So if we can have the TV ad, please. Providing WA netballers of all ages and backgrounds the chance to succeed. For us, that's gold. Educating all Australians that it ain't weak to speak about mental health. That is gold. Creating free educational resources for schools nationwide. Absolute gold. The gold industry is investing in us. And us. And us. To learn more about the gold industry's commitment to our communities, visit goldindustrygroup.com.au. Look, I do really uh, encourage you also to watch uh, our mental health and netball interviews on our Heart of Gold Australia YouTube channel. Yep, we've actually got one. Um, quite a number of uh, videos up on it, and I do encourage you to watch it. WA and Australia as a whole have an incredible geological history and it's really important to share that with our students. We're a not-for-profit that's been working in Western Australia for over 15 years. The most important thing is to just share that passion and enthusiasm and to spark their interest. Students are fascinated by it. The Gold Industry Group's made a really big investment in the education of our next generation, both in the importance of the gold industry, but also in earth sciences. And we've been really happy to partner back to provide our expertise into their programs. Between the hands-on materials and you know the photos and the real context, um, they can really start to feel like they're part of the industry as well and just get a taste for it. We um, became mini geologists ourselves and went exploring for gold. It made me feel like there's more to mining and finding gold than I thought there was originally. It is really important to learn about gold now because of the increasing ways that we can use it in the future for technology, which is constantly increasing. We're providing teachers with material that really engages students and it really is going to enthuse the next generation. Um, and that one really focused on um, interviews um, that expand on the ad that we made and provide a glimpse into the impact of our uh, investment into education, education about the gold industry in the state. This year we expanded our gold education program across Australia and formed a partnership with Australian Earth Sciences Education, which has received a lot of positive feedback from students, parents, teachers and our employee facilitators alike. You can find out more about this program in the brochure on your table or our gold resources kit on display here this morning as you walk through the door. We also were very privileged to launch our National Gold Jobs website in May. So far as we can tell, this is the first of its kind in Australia where we focus on a specific industry and showcase a range of careers and jobs offered within Australia's gold industry. To date, our site has attracted more than 60,000 views, and that tells you something, uh, with more than 200 jobs being advertised on it. Quite an achievement for something that really only got going in May in the middle of COVID. Our landmark partnership across Western Australia continues to go from strength to strength, and I'm sure you all know that I'm talking about Netball WA, West Coast Fever, and the Shooting Stars. Through this, we connect and support the communities that we all work in. 
We're attracting new talent to our industry as we seek to change the perceptions about the opportunities the gold industry and gold mining provides not only to all Western Australians but to all Australians as well. This week we've released the economic and social impact brochure which you should all now have. This shows the true value of our industry to Australia. And this document is a really useful resource for anybody involved in the gold industry so that you can tell our story. In the mental health sphere, we continue to work with members and look forward to announcing a couple of new mental health initiatives very soon. Certainly the Live-In uh, initiative that we've had that I know a number of you have taken part in, we certainly have at the Perth Mint, has been a tremendous success. And finally, in closing, I'd just like to share one thought with you. And it was picking up on a theme uh, that um, the, uh, um, the dealers, the Diggers and Dealers Forum Chair, uh, Jim Walker, made yesterday. So Jim, apologies for recycling your thunder, but it was really good. We are the champions of the gold industry. We own our story. And if we don't tell it, and we don't tell it properly, nobody else is going to tell it for us. It's up to us to tell the rest of Australia about what we do. It's up to us to tell them how responsible and how sustainable we are and what a great career it is for those that are coming up behind us, those that are at school today, either in tertiary university education or in tertiary vet education. There are more opportunities in the mining industry and in gold than almost anything else in this state. And to quote our Premier yesterday, you'd really want to be living in Western Australia and you'd really want to be part of the gold industry at this time in our lives. So thanks very much everybody. I'd now like to invite Deloitte partner Nikki Ivory to the stage uh, to commence our formal proceedings. So thanks everybody and uh, I look forward to a great debate. Good morning. Um, my name is Nikki Ivory. I'm Deloitte's WA mining leader and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today on behalf of Deloitte. Thank you Richard for that um, introduction and um, thank you Jim again also for those comments yesterday because two years ago our topic here was the image of mining and we spoke then about how we need to tell Australia how great the mining industry is and how important it is. And I always pick up my phone and say, without this, I mean, without mining, this wouldn't exist. And that really should resonate with the um, rest of society. So we've been doing this for a few years um, with a topic that we think is relevant and, and topical. And, and hence that image of mining last year evolved into social license to operate. Um, as society's expectations change, we've seen more and more focus on these sort of softer topics, I guess one would call them. And this year's topic is really a further extension of the, that sort of evolution we've seen over the last few years because society's expectations have continued to shift. And I guess the penny really dropped for me in January this year on decarbonisation when BlackRock, one of the world's largest fund managers, seven odd trillion dollars of funds under management, came out and joined Climate Action 100 Plus. Now this group, sort of they call themselves the watchdog, I think, on, on climate, was formed in 2017, but it really felt a little bit like a fringe group until the likes of BlackRock joined it. And I thought, wow, this is, this is serious. Things are going to change now. And of course, in Australia, we have Australian Super, one of our largest super funds, as the front runner or sort of taking the charge on, on making sure that our largest emitters provide more disclosure, more transparency about what they're doing and accountability on their action plans. So this, this is really real and this pressure is coming from investors. But it's not just investors because they also invest in banks. And so they're saying to the banks, cast a green lens over your lending portfolios. And so we're seeing, someone told me yesterday that when they went through um, the banking process, they've just raised money. They didn't only have to get through the credit committee, they also had to get through the sustainability committee. So there's two parallel processes running in banks now. 
This is real. And then the third pressure is coming from customers. So we've heard over the last day the likes of BMW and Tesla are demanding green metal through their supply chains. So Elon Musk actually came out and said, my biggest worry is getting a sustainable source of nickel, green nickel. So what does that mean? Well, we might have thought that COVID would have changed all of this. The focus went elsewhere. But I think the reality is it actually shone a spotlight on how quickly the planet can recover when we remove some of the pollutants. And so I think it's actually accelerated the process in, to some extent. Society's expectations have certainly not changed, that they expect big companies to do something about emissions. So where is the opportunity then? This sounds like a huge challenge rather than an opportunity. Well, fortunately for Australia and WA in particular, what the world is going to need in order to transition to a lower carbon environment is the kind of commodities that we have a lot of. And it's not just nickel and lithium. There's a whole host of commodities that go into batteries and, and, and other, there will be other things that will develop. And they're all going to need commodities. And we have a lot of commodities. So there's a huge opportunity for WA. And the, the even bigger opportunity is to then start adding value to those commodities in our country and not just exporting them all. And we're already seeing that happening in the lithium space, but there will be many more opportunities. It's an opportunity we need to grasp. And then the third thing on this green credentials. So it's no longer going to be enough to say, I produce nickel. They're going to want to know how do you produce that nickel? Is it green nickel and other commodities? So the big miners have clearly responded. I mean, they've had the biggest pressure put on them. This Climate Action 100 is focused on the biggest companies initially. And so we've seen the likes of BHP come out with lots of disclosure, lots of action plans, targets. But the mid-market is not going to be immune to this. And standing still is not going to be good enough anymore. So the question I often hear is, well, it's too expensive. We can't afford to do this. It's the domain of the big miners. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. So what are the questions you're being asked by investors? What is your carbon footprint? What, what is your target and by when will you reach that target? And how are you going to get there? Being able to answer those questions is not a particularly expensive exercise. It's primarily a diagnostic, a desktop-based diagnostic. There are scientific tools and techniques and processes that have been developed that are out there that can make that exercise relatively straightforward. If you want to know a little bit more about how you could start this process, please come and have a chat with us at our booth and we can talk you through the sorts of things that you can do to get started on this journey rather than saying it's too expensive, I'm a mid-market, I'm a small cap, I can't do this. So our panel today is going to focus on this topic and I'd now like to invite them to come up to the stage. I will introduce each one in turn, and while I'm introducing them and while they're coming up, please can you all start thinking of what you might want to ask them as well. We've put them together as sort of looking at it from different angles and different lenses. So they'll each have a different perspective. So please think of your questions. I will start with some questions, but there will be lots of opportunity to ask your questions. So firstly, Mary Hackett. Mary is a non-executive director of Northern Star Resources, and she is also the chair of the Environmental, Social and Safety Committee. Thank you, Mary. Dale Henderson. Dale is the Chief Operating Officer of Pilbara Minerals. As we know, one of our hard rock lithium miners based here in WA. Joanne MacDonald. Joanne is Head of Corporate Affairs and Company Secretary at IGO. 
those of you who have followed IGO, you'll know that IGO has taken on the challenge of transforming themselves into an energy storage company. They do have a gold project, but as we know, that gold project is now on the market. And finally, Michael Wood. Michael's a director at Deloitte here in WA in our Sustainability and Climate Change Services Group. Michael's also the co-architect of Deloitte Decarbonisation Solutions. So thank you everyone for agreeing to be on our panel this morning. So to kick things off, Mary, are we transitioning to low carbon because of this investor pressure or are we doing it because it's the right thing to do? Mm, and, and you gave a really good uh, backdrop to that question, Nikki, the societal pressure, how consciousness is changing. But to be absolutely honest, I, I think it's neither. I think, as with all things, it's a good business decision. It's a good business outcome. You know, when we started on the, and, and most people in the room would, would have experienced it when we, HSC became important to the world, um, there was pushback. There was, you know, people said we can't spend the money. It's, uh, it's a lot of a soft issue and really there is no business imperative. But over time we've seen exactly what's happened. Safety has become absolutely an imperative and we know that a safe worksite is an efficient worksite, is a great place to work, is a, the combination of all just gives you very best business outcomes. And I think similarly now with carbon friendly decarbonisation, sustainable outcomes, our, our people are looking for it. Uh, the market obviously is looking for it, but honestly, if you start now understanding what sustainability is, you get your operations efficient, you work with technology and innovation, you get that low-hanging fruit uh, that will give you those improvements right now. So there are real opportunities here today. You'll move to gas, you'll find ways that gas actually gives you that superior business case to offer uh, better, better results to your investors, to your shareholders. On the market basis, I just think, um, you know, if somebody told you today that gold is going to be this price or, or lithium is going to be this price for the next 10 years, you would work that to death. Today we've been given a complete free pass to say, I know, sure as eggs, in 10 years time there will be a really deep interest in organisations that are clean and that are sustainable would you not set yourself up to achieve that goal? Regardless if you believe the science or not, that's an absolute in my mind. So I think that's what will really take us to that next level and, and force action. Thank you. Um, Michael, so we've heard a couple of drivers. Um, are there any other drivers of this shift to low mining? And, and why do you think it's more important now than ever before? Yeah, so... At, uh, at Deloitte, we commonly refer back to four, uh, four primary drivers, and the first one being obviously policy, uh, the second being technology, third being investor pressure, and Nikki, uh, Nikki, you articulated that really well at the start, and also the supply chain pressure. So I'll just go through those four, four drivers a little bit further. Uh, policy is, is uh, pretty stagnant, obviously, but there's an overarching policy mechanism which provides the longer term direction, which is the Paris Agreement. Uh, Paris Agreement sets that two degree ambition by 2100 and that sets the guide rails for both government and, and uh, companies themselves. So we know where we're heading and why that's important for investors is, is investors are saying if we're going to invest into that entity we need to know that you uh, are at least considering your aligning to, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, the second one's around technology and we all know how quickly that is, that is moving. You know, the learning rates, the cost pathways, the adoption rates are changing so quickly and challenging existing tech. And, yeah, we've got a number of examples such as Agnew Mine here has a, if I can recall, it's got a gas, battery, uh, solar, wind, integrated energy system, which is, which is awesome. Um, Mary, as Mary knows, hydrogen is, is, is um, you know, in the trial phase and it's you know, potentially going to accelerate and disrupt uh, industrial uh, inputs, but also uh, for, for transport purposes as well. Uh, so we know, that, we know that's challenging. I think the other, the other part is around the PPAs, there's been a whole suite of PPAs which are power purchase agreements that have been used for, for, for renewables, but you know, putting the policy aside and the technology aside, we know they're changing, well policy isn't really changing to be honest, but we know the long term direction in which it's heading. 
what has accelerated in the last few years and which has moved it from a perceived soft issue into, hard is into a hard issue is the investor pressure and through the supply chain pressure. So uh, particularly the, on, on the investors, you know, investors, are, investors are wanting to know the compatibility of their investment with a two degree future, full stop. Um, we're, we're seeing institutional um, lenders using concessional loans, for example, uh, for people who aren't aligning to a two degree future. And just as a data point, see, uh, the CEO of BlackRock, you're pulling back to BlackRock again, um, they're looking at climate risk as an investment risk and they're putting sustainability at the core of their investment strategy. So it's another clear market signal. And the fourth one's around that supply chain pressure and that's incredibly important. This is an emerging area. So the customers and consumers are putting upwards pressure on producers to say, we want low or zero carbon products through our supply chain. And, and Nikki once again highlighted examples of BMW and there's a plethora of other different examples coming through. So in conclusion, I've just gone through the four, four macro drivers um, and why this is important more than ever. I think this is going back, that, back to that investor pressure. The supply chain pressure will come, but there's opportunities for the sector. Um, that's probably the, the note I want to finish on is that there's a whole range of opportunities for new commodities and new markets. Great. So then let's talk about mid-market companies, the this, this sort of slightly sceptical um, part of our sector about this. Dale, what are the biggest challenges that mid-market mining companies face in this low carbon transition and, and how might we go about solving these together? Yeah, sure, no, thank you, <coughs> uh, Nikki. Um, yeah, in terms of, um, there's certainly no uh, uh, sceptical view on this space, it, for us it is, is very real and um, being now Pilgrim Minerals Lithium, uh, we're in the battery business. Um, and, and for those who don't know, we're, we're, very, we're very much mid-tier, we're very young, uh, it's our second year of operation. So we have uh, uh, debt on the balance sheet, um, pricing pressures, it's been a tough two years and we're partnered with some really, really big battery related companies. So um, in terms of, uh, I mentioned that as an important backdrop because that really um, speaks to the challenges which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on in a second. But um, these pressures are very real and in the battery business our customers are, are asking for and demanding um, clean product. They want to know, they want to know it's, it's low carbon. So we, we see that coming through in the form of um, what our request basically from Volkswagen, Tesla and those and OEMs flowing through. So we absolutely feel that pressure. But, but frankly, we want it. It's a great, it's a great space to be involved in and, and we should do everything we can to embrace it and, and integrate that into our, our core business. So what, what are the core challenges? Well, really the top three I would summarise as, as I'd characterise as balance. Uh, so that's balancing investment versus cash on the balance sheet. Um, being a, a young company, we've got to make those decisions on how far do we go and, and at what timing. So we, we obviously think uh, long and deep about that because as, as much as we all want to go to solar tomorrow and renewables, everything, it, it costs a lot. So, so it's about balance. Number two, it's about te technology. And what I mean by technology, it's about when, when on that, that technology adoption curve you want to enter and that choice around do you want to be at the innovator end and spend the money in innovation or do you want to be an early adopter become or in the middle ground or be a laggard or obviously you don't want to be a laggard. So that's, that's the key point um, and by example for us we're, we're committed to um, two megawatts of solar penetration going to five megawatts. Uh, we're busy doing that design now. I put that in, in, in the category of early adopter. It's not innovative, it's tried and proven. It's going to work, it works. Um, so we're doing that type of thing. So that's in the technology space. And then uh, lastly, last challenge, um, I'd, I would, I'd call it supply chain understanding and integration. And the, this new world we're moving into, to understand carbon flow and you've really got to have a deep understanding of your partners to a level we've never had to do that before. So that's happening up and down the supply chain and that's, that's fascinating to be involved in but it's a whole, it's a whole new relationship. And uh, yeah, we're, we're getting into that, uh, into that mode uh, very quickly. Fantastic. Um, 
I'm going to move on to Joe now. So transitioning to low carbon, how does this interact with other issues that mining companies are already dealing with? Are there overlaps or synergies between this issue and others? Yeah. Um, on the case, we know there's been um, a number of issues and challenges this year um, for everyone, like what with the bushfires and COVID-19 and now even the ongoing challenges of um, and the pandemic. Um, and as you said, I think um, because of COVID-19, um, um, many of us have sort of appreciate and are more aware of the natural environment now. And I think this in turn has put a greater focus on climate change. Um, but I think we have to be careful not to focus um, too narrowly on um, the emissions and targets. Like, I know this is a critical part of your climate change strategy, but I think they're just uh, many things and actions that um, are part of the bigger picture. And we need to recognize and continue all the great work that we've been doing in the ESG space already. Um, you know, for example, there's um, environment, and that's our rehabilitation programs and our mine closure plans. And this is all about returning the land to its natural state and restoring damaged landscapes. And, and that's going to help reduce emissions. And then in the long, longer term, um, improving our exploration techniques that, again, is going to help reduce these impacts. And, and then there's the governance. Um, being a company secretary, I'm a firm believer that a good corporate governance framework is the foundation of any company. And a diverse board, and that's diverse of sort of skills, experience, age, um, gender, culture, is, is really important because without a diverse board, I think you're really going to struggle to develop and implement an ambitious climate change strategy. Um, and then there's the social side. I think um, for companies to transition to a low carbon future, it's going to change the way we work. And that's going to impact our future employees um, and our current employees. And this in turn is going to you know, have further implications on society. Um, and then as Dale said, there's sort of there's this balance. You know, we have to balance the need of all of our stakeholders. Um, and you know, setting ambitious climate change targets, it's going to fa find favour with some of your stakeholders. Um, but I think companies need to, um, in their strategy, they need to consider a number of things, such as your life of mine um, and um, your cost of these capital investments, such as constructing a solar farm or changing out your fleet of vehicles to electric vehicles. Um, and also investors are looking, as you said earlier, they're looking for a clear um, roadmap to a company's net zero aspirations. And this is a complex area. Um, society is looking for companies to set ambitious climate change targets. Um, and they're looking for ambitious action. But um, a number of companies who've already set ambitious targets, um, they're already seeing that these are outdated. Um, as climate change and um, climate change policy and um, ambition levels have, um, you know, are changing all the time. So this is also sort of like an ongoing issue around the uncertainty of climate change policy um, within Australia and internationally. So yes, there are a number of issues and Quite challenges, yeah. but I don't think we need to see them as competing. I just think we need to consider them all. Yeah. Um, when we're looking at developing a climate change strategy. Fantastic, thank you. So taking that and moving back to Mary then, as a director, how do you think about risk, so not just climate risk, but risk more holistically, and what do you think are the consequences if companies don't prepare adequately for the future? Yeah, I, I, as you look at, um, at the duties of a director, n number one, around strategy and around uh, and keeping due diligence over your corporation, um, from a, a, for me, risk is like right up there. It, unless you're across the critical risks and really understand that you're digging deep into the organization and understanding what can emerge that can knock your company over, you, you're not. Uh, delivering on your duties. I, if you're not seeing climate change, if you're not seeing some form of sustainability risk on your top 10 risk register today, you need to ask why not. It, it's got to be in there. 
Um, so Northern Star ran the process of uh, TCFD, so Task Force for Climate Change Financial Disclosures. How many people are familiar with that process, that framework? Yep. There must be a few. John, put your hand up. <laughs> it, it, it's a really interesting process. So you would think a lot of these regulatory frameworks dull as dishwasher water and uh, certainly don't give you the outcomes you'd hope for. How this emerged was the Reserve Bank of England had a dinner, apparently, and around the table they talked about this, this risk and, and what they could do about it. Um, and from that, they said, from a business perspective, we need something that truly assesses climate change risk from financial. Bloomberg got onto it and Bloomberg rallied uh, the industry around him. So as a result of that, it's not a typical reg regulatory framework. It really is quite a prudent approach to, to looking at risk. So Northern Star ran that process. And I, I was having a conversation yesterday with, with Guy Singleton, who's the head of uh, environment. And he said, the, and I said it truly, is it, was it a useful process? And he said, amazing. You know, no matter what angle you looked at, it from, it brought the team together, the executive together in a way that gave them a lens to look through that they hadn't looked through before. And so there are, are three scenarios, so it's, uh, and, and Michael will know better than me, but it's two degrees, four degrees, five degrees um, change. And you would think from a gold company that uh, chaos is good, right? You know, it's good, it's a stability, it's a, a defense stock. The worse things get, the better gold does. <laughs> but even for a, a defensive stock, two degrees, the, the minimum rise is the best outcome. Because once you go to chaos, society breaks down, you don't get that same commodity build, you don't get that same social outcome. Uh, people go back to survival as opposed to um, building and growing and wealth and, and uh, the outcomes that we see today. So I would encourage anybody to go through that process. The feedback we've had, and, and, and Luke can comment on it, uh, was that it was uh, not an, uh, a, a, an overwhelming process. And the kudos that that's given us in with our investors is immense. And now that we do have a fully formed risk outcome and a risk matrix, associated with that that's usable and that we can take action on today. So very, very powerful. Um, so ask me about risk. Risk is absolutely <laughs> essential and not just recognizing risk, doing something about it. Yep, great. So Dale, as a lithium miner then with that context, um, and you're in the battery supply chain, how, how are you thinking as a company about your transition and, and sort of in the framework, I guess, that Mary's just sketched? Sure. Um, the, the way I describe that is uh, probably in two halves. One would be uh, what weight does do we do we place on this part of part of what we're trying to achieve, and and then secondly, how do we go about implementing it? So, so on the first part, um, it's an absolute priority for us as a business. Um, you know, at the highest level, it's uh, it's about you know, what our business really stands for, and aspirationally. Um, when through the early phases of the business we, we got together and we said what we really want to do is enable the energy transformation and, and lithium is a, is a means to do that. So it's, it's central to our purpose first and foremost. But if, every other stakeholder group around our business wants this to happen. Um, our investors are expecting it. Our customers are demanding it, as I mentioned earlier. Our financiers, it's actually a, a, a commitment. Um, and just by way of short example, Clean Energy Finance Corporation, who's um, cornerstoned our first raising and then subsequently our second raising the other month, we've, we've committed to, to renewables undertakings through them, so that, that's locked, locked in stone and inked. But above all of that, look, I think it's just the right thing to do, is to, to embrace um, carbon out and, and help to, to build a better, better world and a better future. So, so for us, it's an absolute priority. It's very central to what we're doing. So how do we... How do we how are we thinking about the implementation of that? Well, it, it's like every other part of our business. Um, we, we're planning for it and, we, and we're implementing it on, on horizons based on, on what the business is, is can, uh, can afford and is willing to afford. So, for, 
you know, I, I definitely subscribe to, to the idea that for any groups who aren't moving, just get moving. And as it relates to what you can do, there are short-term wins. And so in the case of our business, um, we've, this is in the form of we're engaged with Globe Power, who, who some of you may or may not know, they're a small um, Aussie outfit in Kewdale. They've got uh, lithium-based uh, um, uh, mobile equipment, so scissor lifts, um, lighting plants, that type of thing. So we're engaging with them. Uh, low cost, very innovative, straightforward to do. So there are easy wins and short-term initiatives, which we're doing. As it relates to the long-term category, yeah, that takes time. Uh, for us, that, that's coming in the form of um, the integrated solar solutions, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and down the track, we'd love to be doing some hydrogen and some of those solutions in that uh, HME space. Um, but the caution I have around that is it comes back to that innovation uh, risk profile I mentioned about whether you want to be a, an innovator or an early adopter. Um, in, that, in that category, uh, we're happy to be an early adopter. We'll let BHP and Northern Star do the innovation, and we'll, we'll, uh, we're happy to come in after as an early adopter. Great. Joe, um, IGO's set it about to change its sort of overall business model um, to energy storage. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey so far? Yeah, sure. Um, but, uh, IGO's had a long history and commitment to base metals um, with our long um, Jaguar operations and now at Nova. Um, nickel and copper has been central to our portfolio for a number of years. Um, but then with the global concern um, over climate change and the environment um, accelerating and um, the huge increase in demand for um, renewable energy and energy storage and the electrification of transport, then um, at IGO we, we saw or we believe that this um, demand is only going to increase. And so, we aligned our strategy to um, the metals critical to these new technologies, and in our case, nickel and copper in particular. Um, and as a result of that, we went through a long process of engaging um, our people in the co-creation of our new purpose and um, aligning our culture. And our new purpose, um, making a difference, um, this touches all of the people in our business in everything that they do. Um, and that's from our exploration teams who are out there exploring for these metals, um, whilst ensuring that they care for the land that they're working on, um, to our operation teams who are all the time looking at ways to do things smarter or more sustainably. And then to our corporate teams who may be trying to encourage the next generation of miners or um, working with the community to create shared value. Um, so this culture of care, it's not as if it's anything suddenly new for IGOs. So we've just um, released our sixth sustainability report. And this is where we report on our sustainability performance for the year. Um, this is a very transparent and honest overview. Um, where we not only share our positive stories, but also um, things that we could be doing better. Um, and this report details our response to climate change and our TCFD roadmap. And um, we've been improving our alignment to the TCFD um, year on year. And this year, we included scenario analysis and um, some additional metrics and targets. Um, and this year, pleasingly, we reported um, approximately 75% of um, IGO supplied nickel was processed for the use in downstream battery products. Um, and we've also recently developed our climate change policy um, with an aspiration to be carbon neutral by 2035. Um, We've also you know, been taking our first physical steps, and so with the construction of our solar farm at Nova um, in partnership with Zenith, and that's just coming up to being in operation for almost a year. Um, we've also been doing some trials with um, um, electric light vehicles underground with um, Barminko and Safescape, and um, I'm pleased to say, hopefully very soon, we'll be having our first um, Safescape electric light vehicles on site. 
Um, and we're also, you know, through many sort of people at NOVA, we're also involved in a lot of studies and pilot programs into the acceleration of electrification and mining. Um, yeah, so our climate change journey is, you know, still very new, but um, we're very proud of the steps we've already taken. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing those, that story and those examples. Michael. Nikki. You've been in this space for a while now. Yes. It's changed a lot in the last five years. Maybe just tell us a little bit how you, you know, how you've seen that sure. change, and then what do you predict is going to happen in the next five to ten years? Sure. One thing's for sure: predictions always get me wrong, but I'll give it a give it a crack. <laughs> um, oh, so, what's changed in the last five years? Obviously, a lot. But I think what you know, in the mining sector, certainly around the, the TCFD, that's that has changed the landscape. And uh, um, uh, Mary touched base on it. The TCFD investors are wanting to that. Are wanting to know that um, you know they're they're putting money in. They want to know the longer term risks associated with their investment. And the TCFD it sets out the framework to understand the risks, uh, to calculate the risk, and put that through your financial filings. So it's going back into your financial filings, and that's always a good starting point to to start on this journey. Uh, the other ones around setting decarbonisation strategies. That's what's changed in the last sort of couple of years. And how you do that is you start off with understanding the abatement challenge. So the abatement challenge is where you're going, so that's your forecast, versus where you could be under a two degree future, and that delta between the two is the abatement challenge. And that's a really important calculation, that's your starting point. So you need to, need to know where you're going, where you may need to be through the investor pressure and so forth. Once you understand that, you can, you can work out the costs. So how do you solve that challenge, whether that's through abatement projects or offsets or whatever. Uh, so you, you understand the cost implications to the business. And once you've done that, then you're in the position to go out to market and, and publicise your story around targets and so forth. And yeah, you're right, Joe, around uh, FMG and others and Fortescue and Rio coming out with targets around five years ago having to re revitalise those. But that's just the nature of the beast. That will continue to happen as the underlying science um, enhances as well. So next year, there's a pretty important milestone from a scientific side. Uh, the AR6, the assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is coming out, so we'll expect to see some disruption there and probably changes in, in targets as well. Um, the second part of your question around what do Predicting. I see next? All right, this is the prediction. All right, so <laughs> I'm not a betting person, but someone put, some, put down some notes and see how I go. Um, I, I think certainly the traceability of product, that's an emerging area where, you know, we, whether that's technology like blockchain or whatever, or chemical tracing to trace product from the source down to the end use, that's going to emerge and that's going to become front and centre over the next 10 years. I think the supply chain pressure is only going to increase. That's certainly <coughs> the number two. And these are, these are all pretty high level, high level, of course. And I think the other one's around moving from commitments to action. So, sweet, we've set all these great targets, but now crack on and start to invest. I think that's going to be for the, the board and Exco people in the room here. I think that's going to be the really big challenge is you know, all these projects are fighting against your traditional capital projects and how do you weigh those up and, and historically these have really struggled against um, you know, from an MPV perspective. The tactical stuff, you know, that's easy, you know, sorting pumps, lights, fans, all those types of things, you can put those through. But we're talking about large-scale transformational projects here that are multiple millions of dollars to billions of dollars of project value. So how does that compete with your historical um, projects? So that's probably the challenge is to, to make that choice and how do you contain that narrative and tell that story internally but also externally. So there's my three. Thank you. We will, uh, someone hopefully made a note of that <laughs> and we'll, we'll check back in over the next few years.